Romans 8. And we're going to read the first 17 verses together. And for those not familiar, what we do here is we preach from the week's scripture readings that have been assigned. There's a calendar, a uh, reading schedule that hopefully some of you are involved with and, and, and going along with. And we try to preach from that. And so we're, we find ourselves in Romans this, part of the, this time of the year. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And he didn't uh, have the occasion to have visited them previously. But the Lord had led him, led him to write um, all this wonderful information, exhortation to them. Romans 8, verses 1 to 17. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, but indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's say a quick prayer before we begin. Father, thank you for your word, for what it discloses, for what it reminds us of, and as Mike prayed, we pray for its blessing. God, we cannot take this from you, but we plead that you would shower us with encouragement, with conviction, with enlightenment, illumination of mind and heart and soul. Lord, we pray for the richness of your word through your spirit to bear upon us now, not just for those who listen, even for me, I who speak. Lord, I thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the honor. May you cause us to honor you and to worship you all the more as we hear your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Bible offers so much. God offers so much. You could just pluck certain words out of Scripture. Peace. Who does not want peace? I want peace, even in small, even in the smaller circles of my life. I want peace between my wife and myself. 
Who doesn't? Nobody goes home happy to a bickering spouse. Nobody says, get married, because life is so peaceful, we argue all the time. It doesn't make sense. Who doesn't want love? And with all due respect, you could argue that there's so much desire for love that we are reaching for anything we can find love from. Whatever source, and then be just satisfied with that much so desperate and yet here God is saying I'm offering you so much whether it's we turn to materials or relationships even things that God has blessed us with to enjoy we elevate them far beyond where they should be we say this has got to be it and God is saying there's so much more and sometimes I wonder the lack of pursuit or the lack of vigor and passion in the Christian walk for so many of us, myself included, it's because we forget or we don't realize the depth of what God has not only offered, but what Paul would say has already given you. It's not that I have to wait for it, but everything has been given us. All the blessings of God in Christ. And People may not even use that word heaven, but they imagine, I mean, even John Lennon, who didn't want anything to do with Christianity or religion, he imagined something. He knew that it had to be better, and that he wanted that. And God's saying, I'm giving you that, and elsewhere in Scripture, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, all of those promises, all of them, not most, not some, and actually we would even be tickled with just a few, but all of those promises are yes in Christ, only in Christ, not anything we could steal, not anything we could take or demand or coerce or manipulate, but God freely by his grace showers us with all those gifts. And this is just one of those passages that re-emphasizes that. And it begins, and just in case you are not familiar with Romans, it begins with a rather strong tone, but it's actually meant to satisfy you. It's meant to bring joy into your heart. If you look at verse 1 of 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And God is going to be bold, and he's going to be honest, and he's going to say, I'm going to be real. We like that authenticity. God is as authentic as it gets. We just don't like to hear the truth, which has become a cliche in the English language. We don't want to hear the truth that you and I are born into sin. That's Paul's beginning argument in this letter. Now, that's a strange way to start a letter. He sends it especially to people, as I uh, prefaced earlier, to a church that he never visited. And he's saying, you are condemned in your sin. He's just going to get right to the point. Now, you may be there thinking what I would suspect some of them were thinking, which is, I'm already a Christian. I already believe in Jesus. I don't need to hear that. And what application, what relevance would there be for a believer, let alone you're a young believer, a year or two, or someone who's been a believer for years and decades? What relevance would that have? Well, it's to remind me from where I came from. When you look at all these sports awards ceremonies, and they always go back. I didn't have a father. My mom and I, it was just the two of us. And the athlete who has millions of dollars in the bank is going to talk about how they couldn't even afford a bus ticket. They always go back. Because it that reminder allows them to enjoy and to truly relish the blessing of what they've been given at that moment. So even for me, if I lose that luster of zeal for the Lord, it, it's helpful, and this is biblical, the Bible's prescription, to go back to the past, no condemnation. Joe, you were once condemned. That's a strong word. He didn't say you were dirty. He said you were condemned. No hope. Done. The verdict's been cast. 
But he's saying in Jesus, and this is Paul's point next in around chapters 4 and 5, that you and I have been uncondemned. I just made up that word. Uncondemned in Jesus. That has been reversed. How? Well, if anyone has the authority and the ability to do that, it's God. It's his law. And he offers that to everybody. Why? Because everyone in their sin stands condemned. Romans 3.23, for we all have fallen short of the glory of God. 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the uncondemning part, is the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life, eternal life in Christ Jesus. That's what he offers us. Now, he's saying to you, and I get it, there may be, there's basically two of you in this room today. You may be, well, three. Let's divide into three. You are either someone who, I'm not condemned. I don't need to be uncondemned. I'm just fine. And then there's the second group of you, which is, I'm no longer condemned, and you're a genuine believer. And then there's a third, which Paul even would recognize and mention elsewhere, that you may be someone who believes you're not condemned anymore in Christ, but you may actually be standing st still at this day in condemnation. So but the wonderful thing is the gospel speaks to all three. And the Spirit always has intent to speak to all three whenever we consider his word. So we're just going to kind of move our way quickly through this. And I'll read... We won't, we won't look at every single verse, but I'd like to read as we do make our way through it. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free. You're free. One of the troubling things is getting people to understand this idea of freedom. Paul says it's very clear. Either you are free to sin or you're free to not. There's no middle ground. We like to put ourselves in a separate category because it's obnoxious for God to suggest that I am somehow limited. But let me put it simply, there are so many ways in which all of us are limited. It's funny that when it comes to spirituality, we have this freedom that supersedes anything God wants to put around us or anything that actually exists. And what I mean by that is, and this is how I explain it to my middle school students, I'm not free to be a woman. I don't find that offensive. I get plenty of sleep at night, and I wake up a man. I am free to be a man. That's who I am. And if you're in condemnation and you're in sin, that's all you can do. The great um, theologian Augustine put it this way. In sin, you and I are unable not to sin. That's all we do. All we do is sin. We can't choose otherwise. Now, an unbeliever will say, that's freedom. No, that's not freedom because you're not free to honor God. But then what happens with Christ and him giving his spirit to you is suddenly things get transformed. You get regenerated. These are big theological 25 cent words. And God suddenly makes you, he takes you from a state of unable not to sin to now able not to sin. It is possible. And that's why Paul spends so much time telling you, be this, be that, do this, do that. Be free because you are. But the tendency is for believers to, who are free, the tendency is for them to act like they are slaves. And slaves are not free. It's a, it's a strong word, it, and particularly for um, Americans, people in this country, it has a lot of other thoughts in tow. But God says, don't act like what I have freed you from. Don't be that. It's silly. I freed you, I've accomplished all that was needed to let you enjoy liberty in me. And so he says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. In other words, if you are not in Christ, you are a slave to sin and you are a slave to death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. The law required this, you need to perfectly obey. I didn't do that. Even if, and this is, I don't think it's possible, but even if today I started to try my hardest, the truth is I wasn't able to back then. 
And I look back, and Steve and I can joke about the days of my youth and how immature and despicable I was as a human being. I can look back, but that's still in my record. So I could never achieve perfection from day one. We're just not able to. But God requires that. Now, it's funny how you and I enjoy these standards. If you're Korean like me, the standard is you take off your shoes. I, I even do it for our maintenance guy. Chris, the first day he showed up, I wrestled for like 30 minutes. Do I tell him to take his boots off? Do I not? And, and then I was like, sorry, Chris, you got to take off your shoes. I was more fearful of my wife uh, and, and the stains in the carpet than Chris is like, what? But I told Chris to take it off. And, but that's the standard. That's the standard. Standards for you may be different. But God has this wonderful standard. It's not just simply an arbitrary, but there needs to be perfection. And the reason for perfection is, I don't know about you, but I don't desire to go to heaven if it's imperfect. I already live on earth. I want to go somewhere better. I want to go somewhere better where I don't have to worry that when I wake up tomorrow, there's going to be bad news on the front page. I don't want to worry about tomorrow, it could be the last day of my parents' life because they're getting older. I don't want to hear that because our family takes two cars to work in school that my son gets into an accident. There's going to be no possibility of that, the perfection of heaven. That's what God promises. That's his standard. So it's actually for our enjoyment and our good. But he's saying the only way that happens is through Jesus alone. We've already messed things up. In verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God has given you his spirit. And he's simply saying, live by that. That's who you are. You're someone who no longer has a sinful dead spirit that is a slave to sin and condemnation. But now he's given you the spirit of life that produces life. It's not just simply a replacement. Oh, I broke this or that's broken and shattered. So I'll just give you a new one. But he's giving you the Holy Spirit that reproduces and emanates life. His own spirit. To us. Verse 9 For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And the things of the Spirit fill the, fill the pages from Genesis to Revelation. The things of the Spirit are the things of God. The things of the Spirit are the things that please and honor God. It's not just I serve a new master that I've been sold over to somebody else, but that this is a master who died for me. This is a master who has shown me all bit of affection and love and sacrifice and compassion to me, and I want to do that for him. And that's why later, as we're, just to give you a little peek, that's why later, later he says it's no longer a relationship of slavery. And some people like to look at Christianity and say, oh, so you're telling me I'm a slave to God. Well, Paul actually elsewhere doesn't have a problem using that word. But Paul here will change the word slavery into sonship. And that doesn't mean he excludes women. It just means a child's relationship with his or her father. There's a big difference. So all of a sudden you've gone from slavery, and maybe today the best word to use because none of us have we use it all the time. I feel like a slave in my house. My mom and dad maybe do all this, and our husbands say, I feel like a slave in my house, or whatever it may be. But uh, honestly, they're, they're, you know, not really true. But maybe a great word to use is employment. I feel I'm employed by God. If I don't do this, I may lose my job. Or that I just do what the boss tells me. Or there's a competition and there's a corporate ladder. I got to do better because or else I'm at the bottom, and if I'm at the bottom, I guess that I get less perks, less rewards, a lesser bonus. Do we look at ourselves as employees of God? Now, it's kind of like my, one of my children is actually a student of mine, and there's a dialect, a little bit of tension, because even though he's a student of mine, I do from occasion, uh, on occasion, treat him like a child. I, I'm not 
immature in that sense. I mean, he's my son. I treat him like that in, cla- in the classroom. It's similar. We may have that mixture of, of thoughts, but God is saying you need to throw out the employment slavery image if you really have been set free by Jesus. And so I wanted to jump down to verses 12 on. So then, brothers, we are debtors. We do owe, but not to the flesh, to live according to the, to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Whether you believe it or not, Paul is asserting this fact. If you seek to live your life according to the accomplishments that you think you can muster up and achieve, you will end up in death. Now, if you're a believer and that's what you've been living, yeah, you'll still end up in heaven. But the sad part is you would have had all this opportunity, all these years in this lifetime to promote life and freedom in Christ. And yet the message, your deeds, your words, your emotions have been giving off is live according to the flesh. And then you confuse people. You send off messages that even what I believe up here or even realistically in here, I don't live by, and that's what you should do. Don't, don't go by what's inside, just whatever I'm doing and I'm saying. And we have great opportunity to even share the gospel to unbelievers, to show them this is the truth, this is the gospel, or to encourage other believers who are struggling between living a life of sin and devoting their lives to Christ, that you show them living a life to Christ is worth it. And you show them what liberty and freedom looks like. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by, you, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. And when I think of slavery, I think this is what Paul had in mind. You don't have choices. And it doesn't matter what you think. All you do is what you're told. And you live, and he uses this four-letter word, fear. Your whole life is driven by fear. Fear of what people will say. Fear that if I obey God, that my life is going to be bad, and I may end up hating God, and I won't have this peace that he supposedly promises. And if I don't get that peace, then again, I'm going to think he's a liar. I live in fear. Fear that if I don't achieve this road, which... I may even know conscientiously that it's not the road that God has paved for me. I won't be happy. Or my kids will be less off. And I don't want that. That What I fear the most is that I can't keep up with the Joneses. Or I can't accomplish what my dreams say I can. Or my parents will think less of me. And they won't be able to boast about me in church fellowship. We fear so much. It's funny, even secular psychologists would often tell you, don't live a life of fear. Go for what you are confident in. And God is saying, don't be fearful. That's slavery. Don't fear death because that can't touch you anymore. Don't fear sin because that can't touch you anymore. Don't even fear Satan because he can't touch you anymore. Where it says elsewhere, no one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. You notice, even if you're familiar with the book of Job, the great thing about Job is this. Not just the whole topic of pain and suffering, but Satan has to do whatever God allows him. Now, if there's suffering in your life and you're thinking, oh, maybe God has allowed Satan to do this, I would suggest you don't be angry. You should look at it as a badge of confidence. God thinks that much of you, that you can endure it. If your life is without suffering, it may be that God thinks you can't handle it yet. So Satan can only do what God permits him. And in the end, in that conversation that he has with God, the one thing you can't take from Job, which this is where God draws the line, you can't take his life. And I think that's symbolic of, if anything, Satan may be able to inflict a lot of bruises in you physically and in your life psychologically, emotionally, whatever. But he can't take the spirit that dwells within. That's all that matters. Because in the end, from there, you continue on that road to the place where 
you are no longer tormented, no longer tempted, and you just enjoy eternity. Slavery. And the question I'd like to throw out to you is, what are the sources where you are tempted to be a slave? Or where, what are the sources that tempt you to be an employee of God? where you're trying to get in extra hours so that you can be paid double, time and a half? Or you're trying to do more so that he can take notice and he'll promote you? But it doesn't matter whether the other's promoted. Or like an employee who says, you know, it really doesn't matter. You don't help someone else get promoted. It's about you, your individual future. It's about... Is it, what are the sources that tell you, if I don't do this, I'm going to get in trouble and I may even lose my job? Or maybe, like an employee, you're always on Monster, looking for something that pays more. What are the sources of employment, of slavery? What do you fear? God says the gospel banishes fear. Now, I'm not here to discourage you and say, if you're a genuine believer and you are convicted right now and you're saying, my life is so full of fear, I'm not telling you to go home and say I'm not a believer. I think you certainly should entertain that question because that could be possible. But if in the end you're like, I am certain I believe in Christ, but for some reason I've allowed all these sources to take hold of me, all these sources of employment and, and slavery to take hold of me, I don't feel that freedom in Christ well, God is saying, then go back and remember, now, therefore, there is no condemnation. And you have been freed by the Spirit. And seek that. Live by that freedom. And Jesus did, didn't he? Jesus, the Son, showed what it meant to be a son and a daughter. All the pressures of the Pharisees, some even lingering, maybe it wasn't spoken, be one of us. You know, these people follow you, just join us. He didn't. Or the threats of, we could hurt you. And he wasn't afraid of that. Or the pressure of, you know, you could be really popular. You just have to change a few things. He wasn't afraid about his popularity. He wasn't afraid of the cross. And the cross wasn't just physical pain, but it brought about humiliation, abandonment, even, get this, even to bear someone else's sin and to bear the weight of that pain and suffering, he wasn't even afraid of that. But he was free to do it. He wasn't even afraid of what happens when I breathe my last. What does he do? He puts his, himself into the Father's hands. He's free to do that. But fear would have been like, no, one more breath, one more breath, one more breath, because you're so afraid of what happens next. But God is saying, my hands are right there. I got you. So many sources, and it, it, it is a struggle, isn't it? It almost can be tormenting to think of all the ways in which you maybe enslave yourself or in which maybe even your wife or your husband or your children tempt you to be a slave or the world, and how do I do that in my workplace as a student, as a child? As a parent? How do I do that? It just seems endless. God is saying, I'm above that. I have freed you. They can't touch you. They can't shackle you. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. God may allow them to inflict pain on you. But again, going back to Christ, he has proven that pain is eclipsed by the glory of God. By the peace that Jesus had in that final breath when he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That enabled him even to know that I can take on a Judas. And sometimes when you are free to trust in God, it won't pan out. 
For example, you remember the other words that Jesus said on the cross when he looks out to the crowd and he sees people that were so filled in their bellies by all that fish that he had multiplied, people that have followed him for days and, and weeks and months, maybe even three years straight, and people now who had abandoned him or laughing at him and saying, if he was the Son of God, let him come down from that cross. And he's looking out to all these people who are simply enjoying a spectacle. They got front row seats. What does he say to them? He says, forgive them. He's not afraid that even if I forgive them and they don't reciprocate, that I may not be satisfied in God. But he's confident, he's free. God, I'm going to give that invitation for repentance and reconciliation and forgiveness and to know that your peace awaits me. You'll do with it as you please. Whatever the direction. We could sit here for hours and talk about different examples. But God is saying, you're free to enjoy me. You're free to follow me. And if you don't believe that, then you come up with basically two options. Either one, you don't believe in God, or you think he's a liar. God is saying, you're free to come. You are my children. You know, your children can go into your house, their homes, and they can open the fridge. I remember one of my children's friends came over, and he opened the fridge. And I stared at him, and they said to me, you don't have any chocolate milk. And I'm like, who are you? I was ready to kick this little boy out of my house, but that I probably would have gotten arrested for that. So I let him stay there, but all this time I'm thinking he's not allowed over anymore. <laughs> Children can open the fridge. Children, even though mommy or daddy may not like it, they can drop their dirty clothes on the ground. Children can lie down on their bed. Children can reach for the remote and turn it on. Children don't have to knock and say, can I come in? Imagine that if your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife knocks every time they come home. Can I come in? Come on in. I guess that would be nice sometimes. No. <laughs> but, you know, you get the point. But strangers, people who don't live in that house, who are not children, they must seek permission. You have that permission. Come into the very presence of God, to know that he is always pleased with you, to know that he desires to fill your life with joy and peace and comfort. A God who will always be gentle and kind, not like all of us parents who fail so often. This God, he says, this liberty, this freedom, and this peace is found only in Christ. And he says, don't forget that. And may that define your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what you offer us. The law could not. 